This takes us now to a juncture. We leave chapter 18 with that call for saints to deny worldliness, and we head for one of those views back around the throne. And that's what chapter 19 is. In the first 10 verses, this is what we see. We see what Jesus described in Matthew 8 and verse 11. The first 10 verses are what Jesus describes in Matthew 8, 11. And this is what he said. In fact, this is one of my favorite descriptions of heaven. Jesus gives in Matthew 8, 11. Many will come from the east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Did you know when Jesus describes the saints in heaven, he describes it as a giant banquet. Now see, to the, the best way to understand the Bible, remember the first canon of textual interpretation is to understand what it meant to the people it was first written to. To most of the people in the first century, they got up early in the morning, went out and worked all day, came home dead tired at night, and ate their meal and went to bed to go back to work. I mean, they just worked all the time. And if they didn't work, they couldn't eat. And so a banquet where you sat and didn't work and had food put in front of you that you didn't go out and cultivate or grind or catch or clean or whatever was an unbelievable delight. Think about it. Are you getting ready for the ultimate banquet? The greatest party of all time is approaching. The King of Kings, the Lord of the universe, is preparing a wedding feast like no other. It's in the most breathtaking location imaginable. He's spreading an immense table. The greatest names of all time will be present. At dinner, the invited guests will be rubbing shoulders with Adam and his lovely wife, Eve. And their twin son, Abel, will be sitting next to them, as well as Seth and his wife. And not too far away will be the amazing preacher, the earliest known prophet, Enoch, and his family. That's what Jesus is saying. They're already there. And we're going to join them. That's the first ten verses. Well, how do we understand the book of Revelation. This chart is just a reminder of the technicalities of interpretation. Eschatology, that's the theological term for last things, has three divisions. See it on the chart? The amillennial view and preterism, or the postmillennial view and reconstructionism, or the premillennial view. That's us in this class. And most of the popular teachers that you know um, and, and maybe have their study Bibles, are these type of people. Uh, amillennialism would hold to what we would call a non-evangelical, allegorical view of the Bible. And so basically, the, the non-evangelical churches, mainline denominational churches, do not believe that prophecy is talking about the events that, that they would say all these are symbolic, but they're not literally what they say, other than this one. Uh, even the mainline denominations believe in the second coming. But they don't know anything about the context for it, and they certainly don't believe in this part, the lake of fire. And so that chart is just to show you hermeneutics, that's how you interpret the Bible, from allegorical to literal. Allegorical is amillennial, uh, kind of center is postmillennial, but premillennial, pre-tribulational, evangelical belief is taking the Bible for what it says. But what does uh, chapter 19 tell us? Four things. The first verse, I heard the loud voice of a multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord. We celebrate our salvation when we get to heaven. That's the first lesson of chapter 19, verses 1 and 2. Secondly, we celebrate in verse 2 his judgment because he is the one who has avenged the blood of his servants. In verses 4 and 5 of chapter 19, when we get to heaven, there's another alleluia, and that's the alleluia of worship. And finally, in verse 6, uh, it's the alleluia of our sovereign God. So we come in verse 7. See what it says in verse 7 of chapter 19? Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory. Now, this is one of my favorite favorite parts of the, the book of Revelation. Look what it says. For his bride has made herself ready. Keep reading in verse 7. 
His wife has made herself ready, and to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen are the righteous acts of the saints, clothed in this fine linen. So this is what we're going to be wearing in heaven. Want to know what you're wearing in heaven? Fine linen. What is it made of? Righteous acts of the saints. Did you know one of the saddest things I know of is people that are taught that we're under grace and it doesn't matter how you live and the Lord's already forgiven us. So, you know, it's okay to just kind of slip and slide and be in the ditch half the time and kind of live like a lost person. And those kind of people mock those who deny ungodliness, who get up early in the morning and spend time in the Word, are always memorizing, are always saying, no, 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 I don't think I can do that. I don't think it'd please the Lord. And they just laugh at them. Do you know what is going on here? Look, look again what it says in verse 7. The Lamb has come, his wife has made herself ready, and she's arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. We're going to a wedding banquet where we're going to wear what we were in God's sight as his servants. Did you know that verse is so powerful that it changed the life of Martin Luther? Martin Luther, see the slide? I have two days on my calendar. Today and the day I stand in front of Jesus Christ clothed with what I lived, the righteous acts, that I, the choices I made, the sanctified choices Sanctification, remember I've told you all the way through this class, sanctification is how useful I am. It's usefulness to God. Martin Luther said, I'm living my life every day seeking to be useful to God. That's why the Lord's Prayer, I focus on my Father in heaven. I say, thy kingdom come. I want you to control me. Your will be done. I want to follow you. Why? Because I'm headed to this banquet. This banquet is described in 2 Corinthians 5, 9 through 11. And you know what it says there? We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that we may each receive for the things done in our bodies, the righteous acts. What, what is that going to be like? It says in Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 and 10, that we're going to be in front of a throne burning with fire and a river of fire coming out in front of it. Why does that matter? Well, 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 15 Actually, I'll never forget the moment I understood this passage. When I was in high school, I used to go to Burger King because they had Whoppers, which were this big around. Whoppers today are, I call them whimpers. They're about that big. They used to be as big around as a saucer. And you could get two for 99 cents with a coupon. And I would get my two Whoppers. I'd eat them in my car. And I would, I would just enjoy going to Burger King. But what I was doing one day is, after I made my order, I moved down the counter and I watched them and I saw the way that they cooked them over flames. And they would put the patties on this little conveyor belt and it would go over a fire and the fire would be coming up through and on the other end someone would catch what didn't get burned up and would put it on a bun and give it to me. And all of a sudden, I saw 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 15. And this is what it says in 1 Corinthians 3, and it changed the direction of my life as a high school student. It says, take heed what you build on, verse 10. Verse 12, for anyone who builds on this foundation, gold, silver, and precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. Verse 13, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire. The fire will test each one's work. If anyone's work which he is built on endures, he'll receive a reward. The righteous acts of the saints. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he'll be saved so as through fire. This is describing the Bema Seat judgment. Do you see on the slide? Obedient, obedience, what we do under sanctification, all good for him is eternal and a crown. What's wasted, what burns up, is all good for nothing. The time we spend doing things that aren't sin, they just don't last. Is it a sin to watch a football game? 
Absolutely not. Is it a sin to watch Home Shopping Network? Is it a sin to play a video game? Well, if you're murdering, it is. If there's bloodshed, if there's witchcraft, if there's immorality or nudity, it's sin. But if it's just playing, you know, playing some game, is it sin? No. But look in the middle of that chart. It's wasted. It's good for nothing. It's burned. The cross took all my sin and shame away. And everything that's wasted gets burned up at that moment of the judgment seat of Christ. But what makes it through the fire is what lasts forever. What's the only thing you can take to heaven? People. Well, that takes us to the final section before we go, the second coming of Christ. The second coming of Christ is the return of the King of Kings. It's described all the way through the Old Testament. We've talked about all the vengeance of Jesus Probably the climactic moment is described in Zechariah 14, 12. Let me read it. The second coming of Christ. He's coming in the clouds with all of us behind him. All the armies of the earth, Armageddon, are right there. We already saw that in chapter 16. They're all standing there, marching toward Jerusalem to destroy the Jewish people. Jesus shows up in the clouds and listen to what Zechariah 14, 12 says. Totally parallel with Revelation 19, 14 to 21. And this shall be the plague the Lord will strike the people with who fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh will dissolve while they stand on their feet. Their eyes shall dissolve in their sockets. Their tongue shall dissolve in their mouth. It's the vengeance of Jesus. It's his wrath on sin. What it's saying is Jesus will right all wrongs. Do not avenge yourself. Romans 12, 19 says, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation and reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. 2 Peter 2, 9. That, Jesus righting all wrongs, is when the world passes away. Lesson for us, are you living for what lasts? Do you know what helps you to live for what lasts? Watch for Christ's return. He's coming back. He wants to clothe us with the righteous acts we offer for him. Sanctification. Sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth.